right, so what do you think here? If the workers took the owner of the vineyard to court, the owner of the vineyard uh, would probably lose, right? So let's get the details of the story straight. There's this wealthy landowner who has a vineyard. And not uncommon during Jesus' time would be the hiring of day laborers who would get paid for their day's work at the end of the workday. So day laborers would go out to the marketplace or the public square and hope that the landowners would need some help. So let's say it's harvest time and he needs more laborers for, for the harvest. You know, perhaps a modern day of putting this kind of, kind of employment would be like temporary contract work, uh, but you get paid at the end of each day. So, so normally in this period of the Roman Empire, the pay for a full day's work was called a denarius. You know, each person would get a denarius at the end of the day. And remember, they obviously didn't have electricity back then or flashlights. So to take full advantage of the sunlight, as the gospel said, the landowner went out at dawn to go look for laborers. So basically around 6 a.m. Uh, to hire laborers to begin working right away, making an agreement with them beforehand that they would receive a denarius at the end of the day, the usual day's wage. That's what it means when, um, when it says in the translation, uh, the usual day's wage, it's a denarius. Then the landowner returned to the marketplace uh, a few hours later, as we heard in the gospel, right? At the third hour, you know, third hour is an ancient way of saying 9 a.m. Because if the day starts at 6 a.m., then seven, eight, nine, that's the third hour, right? And so if the day begins, uh, or uh, so the landowner did the same thing again at the sixth hour, which is around noon. So six, six hours later, sixth hour, noon. Then the ninth hour, which is around 3 p.m. So basically every three hours, the landowner went out to go and find more laborers. Now, the end of the day was about 6 p.m. in the evening, which is around the time that the sun would begin to set during the harvest time. So the people he hired at 6 a.m., they would have worked a 12-hour shift. The people he hired at 9 a.m. would basically have had a nine-hour day. The people he hired at noon would have worked six hours, and the people he hired at three would have only worked for three hours. But did, did the landowner stop looking for people at 3 p.m.? No, he kept on going, didn't he? he? He went out at the 11th hour, 5 p.m., the last hour of work, to try to hire people to do just one hour of work that day. And they did it in the cool of the day. Have you, you've heard of the expression, at the 11th hour, right? You know, you know the source of it, right? It makes sense. So, what happened then? When evening came, around 6 p.m., the landowner said to his foreman, hey, bring the laborers in, give them their pay. And here's the interesting thing. The landowner said, okay, begin paying the, the first, the last ones I brought in, and work your way back to, and end up paying the ones that first came in last. And so when the ones he hired at 5 p.m. came up, they each received a denarius, the usual day's wage. And so when the others came up, they obviously thought they'd be receiving more for having worked more hours. But even the first ones who by that time had been out in the field working a long 12-hour shift, many of them under the scorching heat, many of those hours being in the scorching heat, even they got the same one denarius a person. Foul, unfair, right? <laughs> Again, if the workers took the owner to the vineyard to, to, of the vineyard to court, the owner of the vineyard would probably lose. I mean, what kind of employer would pay someone who did 12 hours of work the exact same amount as someone who did one hour of work? Equal pay, what happened to equal pay for equal work? You know, those laborers didn't work equally as long as everyone else, so they don't deserve the same amount of pay. Plain and simple. It would be plain and simple in this world, 
But remember what Jesus is trying to illustrate and, te and to teach them. Not about what the ways of the world, our world is like, but what the kingdom of heaven is like. And with Jesus coming into the world, he's ushering the kingdom of heaven in. The fulfillment of which will not happen until the eternal kingdom of heaven, when all things will be consummated in time and space. So Jesus comes in and says, I'm going to turn your ways upside down, basically, to disorient you so that you can come to these higher truths. It's not that some of the ways of the world is not true, right? Grace builds on nature. But I've come so that to disorient you so that you can realize that you can't come up with God's ways on your own. Remember that God, like that first reading said, God's ways are not our ways. And so I want you to be renewed by the transformation of your mind. This is what the parables are trying to teach us. There's always a twist to them because we think it's going one way, but then it, the, the conclusion is actually something different. So what does the landowner's response tell us about God's ways? The landowner said, my friend, I'm, I'm, not, te I'm not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what's yours and go. In other words, I didn't, didn't pay you any less than what we had agreed upon. Then the landowner said, what, is I, what, what, what if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Am I not free to do as I wish with my own money? In other words, I can choose to do what I want with what is mine. Do I tell you how to spend your money? All right, then the landowner said, are you envious because I am generous? That's a loose English translation of the literal Greek, right? Literally in Greek, it would say, is your eye evil because I am good, right? Is your eye evil because I am good? In other words, do you have an eye of envy? Seeing and desiring what I have given to someone else and thus wanting something that is not yours for yourself. Remember from two Sundays ago, I preached on the danger of coveting and how desiring something that rightly belongs to someone else, that can lead us to a sense of entitlement or a lack of appreciation for what we do have. So this landowner is saying, are you envious of what I have generously given to another? Right, that money is his, not yours. Why are you angry at my generosity to another person? How is the way I choose to distribute my blessings any business of yours anyway? In other words, whose kingdom is the kingdom of heaven? Whose vineyard, who's the owner of the vineyard, the kingdom of heaven? It's God's kingdom. And he wants to bring into that kingdom everybody, no matter how late they come to the party. And what everybody will receive is the same denarius, that is salvation, eternal happiness, and divine sonship being brought into the family of God as his sons and daughters. So here's the truth of the matter about the kingdom of heaven, how it's different from the ways of the world. None of us could ever earn that denarius of eternal salvation and eternal happiness. Yes, it, if it was truly our work that earned that denarius, then the people who work more should receive more. See, it re was really the work of the landowner's son, Jesus Christ, that gives us salvation and eternal happiness. We don't earn that, right? It's freely given to us, our justification. As the Catechism states in number 1996, quote, our justification comes from the grace of God. Grace is favor, the free and undeserved help that God gives us to respond to his call to become children of God, adoptive sons, partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. Right, friends, you can't buy your way into a family. Not into God's family anyway. That's the paradigm shift we need to have. If we think we've earned it, not only are we delusional, but we view our, relation, or we view our relationship with God as transactional 
rather than familial, right? As a slave rather than as a son. So what we're doing in working the fields of the kingdom of heaven is working in the family business. And our business is accelerating the coming of the kingdom, working faithfully to cultivate our present world so that as we pray in the Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as you can see in our world today, we've got a lot of work, don't we? And so you and I as co-laborers in the vineyard and members of the body of Christ are invited to take on the mind of Christ, that is to be generous and like God desire that as many laborers come into that vineyard as possible to advance the work of the kingdom. Not being envious of the people who come into work late, even at that last hour. Just as a concrete way of trying to put this attitude of God the Father into practice, you probably heard that the news that the Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruther, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died. And we know from her public life that she wasn't a disciple of Jesus Christ. From what we know, she didn't believe that she was a cultural Jew, but she didn't believe that God, the, the God of the universe, came into this world, broke into the dimension of space and time in Jesus Christ to call humanity back to call humanity to repentance and to live a life of love patterned after him and ultimately into eternal happiness in union with him. So when I heard the news of her passing yesterday morning, I, my first instinct was, you know, I prayed that she chose to accept God's mercy, to accept that invitation to work in the fields of the heaven, of the kingdom of heaven, even if it was in the 11th hour. See, our desire for the salvation of someone shouldn't be affected by whether or not you've, you or I have been working a 12-hour shift and that someone else has only been working for that last hour. Even if, it, if that someone else had formally advocated against the commandments of God and, and the work of the kingdom. Jesus calls for our joy for those who enter and work the fields with us should be like the joy of the master. So friends, we shouldn't be envious of people who come into the work of the kingdom late because of those two reasons, right? Number one, we need all the help we can get. <laughs> and number two, uh, you know, because the harvest is plenty, the labors are few. Number two, we wouldn't want, we would not want it any other way for ourselves as laborers in the vineyard who otherwise would have simply been standing around idle, unfulfilled, lacking the very meaning and mission of our life on earth, were it not for the generous master inviting us, consistently checking up on us to see if, we need, if, if the people need to be brought in and, and work uh, in his vineyard and share the fruits of the labor. So let us resolve then to reflect the heart of the Father in his generous mercy and in his desire for all to come into the kingdom of heaven even at the 11th hour.